Welcome to Tell Us Your Story, the podcast that tells the diverse stories of businesses, leaders, and influencers throughout Northern California. Our mission is to ignite inspiration, foster education, and bring our community together. Join us as we unravel the path to achievement, discovering how these remarkable businesses and leaders navigated obstacles, conquered hardships, and transformed failures into success. In today's episode, we sat down with Troy Goings. It was an absolutely incredible conversation. There's going to be a few things that you'll take away. One is creating opportunities and taking risks. Troy has has taken on so many different careers and so many different paths to get to where he is today. And it doesn't happen without recognizing where there is an opportunity and then absolutely taking a risk. Uh, mistakes um, and overcoming mistakes are a big part of Troy's story. You know, made some decisions, ended up spending some time in prison. He's going to walk through that experience, what it taught him, and where he's at today following that time spent in prison. And then take advantage of every moment. Uh, you meet people throughout your life where you're like, wow, they do a lot. When you sit down and listen to Troy and how he takes advantage of every moment and how precious it is to him and where he wants to be at the end of his life, take advantage of every moment. So stay motivated, stay inspired, sit back and enjoy this episode of Tell Us Your Story. Early, my early childhood, my father was military, so traveling a lot. Um, I believe in fourth grade, I, I went to three different fourth grades. So there was always the new, I was always the new kid in school, always the... Uh, the person with no friends. And then I didn't want people to get close to me because I was just going to move again, you know? So um, I have two other brothers. Um, I'm the oldest of the three. So let me ask you a question there. So because you guys were traveling a lot, did that bring you, you and your brothers closer together? It did. Um, we spent a lot of time in a car. My dad, man, this guy would never stop. As far as we would drive from North Carolina to California in like mm. three days, this guy just would not stop. He didn't yeah. want to stop. He wanted to hurry up and get there. <laughs> um, I mean, I when I mean he didn't want to stop, we're talking the old Folgers can. That's how we peed. He was yeah. not stopping. <laughs> Wow. Not stop. Is your mom in the picture? My mom was in the, the picture, <laughs> but she eventually would have to say, "Hey, you know, we need to stop. We, the, they're they, they need to get out of the car yeah. and rest up." But he, this guy, would drive overnight. Like it was unbelievable. What branch of the service was he in? He was in the army. Got it. Got it. Okay, so, um, you two brothers, mom and dad. Yep. And. So take us through. So you're moving around a lot. What was your what was your youth like? Is it your typical military? It was or? yeah, very military. We we're always on a military base. My dad was gone. Mom always you know stay at home. Mom I had the laundry done, the cookies made after school. Um, it wasn't bad. Um, the army provided quite a bit for us. I, it, from my memories, you know, we had like I had an Atari when I was you know, I think. 10 years old for Christmas. So that was like the big gift that I got. So it wasn't like it was, it's weird. Cause like it was after the military when my dad got discharged from the military when the family struggled and he had to work three jobs to put, you know, things together for us. But, um, uh, yeah, it wasn't. And when he was in were would you say it was a strict, was it that military strict? Was he that type of discipline? My dad? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Yes, my dad was very strict. My dad, um, when he became a grandpa, it was not the same dad <laughs> that I had. I, yeah. I don't know what happened. Aww. When the change happened, I didn't even recognize him anymore. I remember a story, my youngest, or I'm sorry, my oldest daughter, when she was probably about five, she broke something in the house, and I was like, oh, my God, you're going to get it. <laughs> grandpa is going to beat that butt. <laughs> and I was waiting. I couldn't wait. <laughs> And uh, he picked her up and held her and said, it's okay. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Where was yeah. this Who guy? are you? <laughs> Completely different. Yeah. So how old were you when he got out when, when he retired? From the um, I want to say uh, sixth grade, fifth, fifth or sixth grade. And then that's when he, we moved to, to um, Sacramento permanently. And then as you're going through your, your middle school years and your high school years, what kind of student were you? What, what, what were your likes, dislikes? I, I hated school. It was school. a big smile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't stand school. I was anything, 
if the, if I had any reason not to do my schoolwork, that was going to be the reason why. I mean, I remember one time, I think it was, in fact, my parents were not going to let me go to fr my freshman year. They had told everybody or they had told me I'm going to be held back. I had a 0.8 grade average. I didn't even have a oh, 1.0. Wow. And my parents were just, you're not going to freshman year. You're, you're staying back. I told all my friends, I'm not going with you guys. I'm going to do this crap again, you know. <laughs> um, and my dad, I'll never forget, my dad put my my report card, the .8 grade average report card, on the outside of my bedroom door so that when it was facing the hallway, so when anybody came in to visit, he said, hey, come look at this. This is unbelievable. Have you seen anything <laughs> like this? A point eight grade average. How can that? Like he would like tell everybody my yeah. point eight grade average. Like trying to make me feel stupid, but like that's an accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> and go ahead. Oh, I was just so when um I, just curious. So your dad uh, left the military. So was that like by choice or retirement? He was. Or? Uh, he had a dis. Um, it was a. What was it called? Uh, medical discharge. So after okay. twenty something years, they they went ahead and discharged him medically. Um, I don't remember exactly what the medical reason was, but I I do know that 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 was that and that was, was a, a big transition for the family. Yeah, because we change, went or? from we went from like you know I felt like we were doing better, or and then once you know I mean my mom used to work also, I mean she didn't have to do that, but then she started working, and then my dad was working like two three jobs, mm -hmm. and um, we still like. You could just feel the difference as far as like the clothes. My mom would have people come and drop clothes off to her mm -hmm. at work for us, like hand me downs. Like they always knew that we needed clothes. And so that wasn't the, the issue when we were in the military. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was a big, big change. Um, and then. Um, do, you, do you remember that being a happy time? Or like, did you. It like, even there was a change, right? Did you. Could you. Like a lot of time you hear, I was poor, but I didn't know I was poor. It right. We, uh, we, I guess when you look back, you that kind of like taints the image. I don't feel we had, it wasn't bad. Like it wasn't like sad and like, oh, when's our next meal coming? It was never like that. My dad always made sure that he had the, the family taken care of. But, um, but again, we, my dad was working two, three jobs. Yeah. So, Though we didn't see him much in the military because he was always off doing missions or whatnot, we still didn't see my dad that much because he was working three jobs, like security jobs and construction and things like that. So it's easy now when we're at our age to look back, and we're about the same age, almost 50, and say, dad was making sacrifices, he was doing everything mm -hmm. to take care of the family. Did you know that then, or did you just know dad wasn't at home? No, we knew. We knew. Um we just knew. I don't think we ever like held any bad ill will towards him because he just wasn't around. But yeah, yeah. good. And go ahead. Oh no, I was going to ask him about school that go he ahead. didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're not a fan of school. So what? Not. What? Um, what were you doing at the time? Getting into trouble? Were I wasn't a bad kid. Or? I just didn't. I had this. Just I just didn't want to. If there was something I, I excel at things that I want to do. Yeah. Right. Um, I think a lot of people are like that. Um, that's why I'm not a big fan of school because they push it so much to you. Like you got to school and I'm teaching my kids, Hey, just get a C in this class. If this isn't what you're good at, just get a C in this class or a D. I don't care if you get a D pass this class, <clears throat> get your credits, go on and do things that you like to do. Like if you're good at art, show me you're good at art and get the A in art. And then, you know, if you're struggling in math, math was my worst subject. If math, I couldn't stand math. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't good at it. And, and I would, that was the one I would always fail. Um, and I just didn't care to do it because it didn't interest me. Does that make sense? Like I want, if there was, um, if I got to write a story or talk or create, be creative, I was, I always excelled at that. But if I had to like put multiplication problems in and how many apples does Sally have left? Like I'm not good at stuff like yeah. that. Sally's yeah. got too many apples. <laughs> I always have too many. You just have to find out what you like. You said, right. were there were there hobbies? So isn't anything creative? Um, any hobbies <clears throat> or things that you did outside of school? Um, outside of school, not really. I know we did Boy Scouts for a little bit, but I wasn't a fan of that. Yeah. Um. 
I didn't really have too many hobbies. Uh, I used to always, so I was always a creative person. Like me and my brothers, we always spent a lot of time in the house because my parents had a strict rule. We couldn't go out of the house when they're not home and they would be gone a lot. So we would always be really creative. We used to like write plays together, perform them for my parents. And we would also like um, do like little TV shows or like, I used to always pretend I would have a cassette recorder and I would pretend to be on, on the radio. Like I would always want to entertain. Very cool. Yeah. Entertainment. Yeah. yeah. So you're in high school. What are you thinking about the future at all? What does that look like? Not really. Well, I, so I always had it in my head that I was going to leave high school, move to LA, be this huge actor. And that was going to be my, my thing, my jam. And, um, uh, school, I didn't start doing good in school till sophomore year. Um, I wouldn't say good, decent. Like I got, um, I got kicked off. So we moved to Blythe. My dad got a job at the Department of Corrections and they pick, you had a choice of, he had a choice of Pel- Pelican Bay, which is up north from here or Blythe, which was in the middle of the desert in Southern California, like in uh, like the Death Valley. And I don't know why this man chose Blythe, but <laughs> so I never forget our first day in Blythe. It was 125 degrees. Oh my gosh. Oh and I'm gosh. not exaggerating. We tried to go get in the pool and it was like taking a hot bath. <laughs> it was awful. And we could not figure out why my dad picked this. My dad used to always have this dream of living in the desert and, you know, being like a little Indian, I guess. I don't know. But we, uh, that was such an awful year. Um, and Blythe, uh, it was my sophomore year. So I was playing, I played on the football team, but then they called me in and told me I couldn't play anymore because they had the transcripts from up here Mm. taken down there and I didn't have a 2.0. So, um, I got asked to leave and that was the last time I ever not had a 2.0. The, the feeling that I had that day when I was told to turn in my gear, I'll never forget. Even my dad went to the school to try and talk to them and like, can you put them on academic? They're like, nah, his grades were way too low. So did you end up getting it up to 2.0 and playing football after that? The season was over. But I got in. That's when I was, uh, got into wrestling. Oh, you got into wrestling. So yeah. you brought your grades up for sports. I wanted to play sports. I knew yeah. I wanted to play yeah. sports. And what was cool though, like I guess the the one benefit positive about going to Blythe was a I didn't have like all the distractions of my friends. It was I was like I didn't know anybody. You're the new kid again. A new kid again. Yeah, we. I've been I've been here before, right? Um, but like I was able to just focus on making changes for myself. You know, what I mean, without having the peer pressure of, Hey, let's go do this. Let's go do that. Uh, you know what I mean? I'm not worried about being cool anymore. Yeah. Was sophomore year. And so, and did that carry all the way through <laughs> yes. your senior year? So you, did you stay in wrestling? Oh yeah. All I the excelled. way through. So that was a passion. I for excelled you. in wrestling. Yeah. I actually enjoyed it. I, I went on to become the captain of the wrestling team. Um, I just, I really excelled at it. And it was, that was the last, like 2.0 grade average was that was a, mandatory like i wasn't i wasn't gonna lose that spot yeah so it's interesting so you went from for lack of a better term an introvert who didn't want to be around people you're moving all the time to the captain of the wrestling team so now you're in a leadership role yeah was this like a community to just click with all these kids yeah it was your spot it well they were the same kids so keep in mind my freshman year was freshman year, junior high, they were the same kids that I went to. Mm-hmm. Sophomore, when I went, moved to Blythe, I didn't know anybody. When we came back my junior year, because we only did Blythe one year, oh, we, could, we couldn't gotcha. take it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so now it was like, it's a different Troy than what people remembered. Did you put on weight? Did you oh, like, become a young same. man? Mm-hmm. So, it, yeah, some, it was funny because when I came back to school, a lot of people were like, Man, we heard you died. Like <laughs> we thought you were a ghost. I'm like, Kids what? Are so crazy. <laughs> yeah, we th- we heard you died, and I was like, no, nah, I didn't die. I mean, I felt like it. I felt like I was in hell. But um, yeah, no, I didn't. So I came back. So here's what's funny: is my freshman year, I was four eleven, eighty five pounds. My sophomore year, I wrestled at one o three. No, I apologize. Yeah, 112. I wrestled at 112 pounds. When I came back up my soft or after sophomore year, my going into junior year, I remember I probably weighed about 130. And like people were like, whoa, who are yeah, you? I had grown. Jump. I had grown. 
That's a big jump. So you came back, you're, you're different Troy. and Different Troy. Didn't hang out with the same people. I still had, like, that's what I mean. That whole transition, going to Blythe is what made me more into who I am today, I believe. Because that's when I started, like, discovering who I truly am and what I'm going to accept, what I'm not going to accept. Put Really guiding me into that power role of being the captain of the wrestling team and always exceeding in wrestling. And, and, and I've trained so much and I'd get up in the morning and I would run in the morning, even when we weren't supposed to, you know what I mean? Like I really found, found passion. R- wrestling is what developed. I would say wrestling is who became, made me who I am today. And so did you have aspirations of going on and wrestling in college? Or I did. Um, but then I also had this other aspiration of moving to L.A. and Being that actor. Yep. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. As soon as I graduated, I, um, I probably about like a year after I graduated, I, I saved up. I thought at the time was a lot of money. I had $1,500. And I was <laughs> like, let's go. I, went, I moved to L.A., put all my stuff in a car, moved to L.A., and found out that they wanted the first the deposit was like 50 with the first month was 1500 and i had zero dollars after that yeah so so go ahead oh i was just um so moving around a lot Mm -hmm. i'm sure like at the time it's hard i assume and then when you but it it gives you this like side where you can go and pack up your stuff and go to la and so was that you just were totally comfortable doing that did you think it was like i'm going out on a limb here what what was that i never have fear when people i get that question a lot like were you scared are you nervous i don't have that yeah it's i've always known that i will make it work like i just know i'm gonna make something work and and so far knock on wood everything has pretty much been that direction like a lot of times people will especially like in business right people will plan i we need to have a plan for this year a budget and blah 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 and i don't do none of that i just go make it work i expand make it i'm gonna make it work and it's just that's just what works for me and it gives me that drive if i i do my best work when my back's up against the wall Mm. yeah so walk us through going to la you're going down there to be an actor do you know people down there? Or are you just packed up? Are you 18, a, 18 at the time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had a roommate. We um, met up here. He he got a place. And then, like, I went down there and um, we split the rent. Um, it was a, it was like a, it was a weird apartment, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, he had his own entrance that had, like, I think there was a studio And a regular one bedroom. And then there was like, I think they made the wall right here. Like there was a door. So I think they opened it up for both of us. So Mm -hmm. he had his own entrance on this side with his own bathroom and a huge room. And then I had like the living room, the kitchen, and then like my room too. And then like, yeah, but my half was 1500 for the deposit. And what were you... What was the plan? Just to get into acting? Yeah, so he... That was the plan. Um... But obviously things don't go right off the bat. That's not how things work in life. Um, He was working for his aunt at a a PR firm. And then like I went and helped him for on a couple of projects and then I'd get a little bit of money. And then um, what was funny was the Internet was kind of brand new back then. This was 19. 90 i graduated in 93 so 94 95 i remember a hotmail account i was like what is an e- what's an <laughs> yeah. email what is an email yeah. i was like it's an electronic mail system i'm like what yeah. is this you had to pay for the internet by the minute <laughs> yeah yeah so i got this he created this whole hotmail account for me and i was like this is hotmail okay <laughs> and, and i didn't understand what was going on he was kind of showing me the roast but then we um uh, and then we went on the uh, internet on this thing called the internet and <laughs> there was job postings. And so I would look for jobs that were, that I could do and find something fast. And this is quite funny. Um, I found this job where I was a dancer, not like it was, let me explain oh, this. Oh, the story's <laughs> yeah, getting good. <laughs> this is getting good. So the dancer was you get paid every, so in LA they would have, um, an entertainment company and it had a DJ. And um, so with the DJ, you'd have dancers that come with it. And LA is big for like bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs and weddings and things like that. So like if somebody hired the entertainment company for the DJ, you'd have two 
two dancers that go with it. So I was the dancer. What um, kind of dancing? So as the wedding or the bar mitzvah or anything's going on, and if you see somebody that's sitting down that just just is like you you get, hey you want to come oh, dance? Oh God, I hate those people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was I'm me. Like, I'm like, don't come over here. Well, don't tap your foot. <laughs> don't tap your foot. We I won't come over. You see it in your eyes. Yeah. So were you a big dancer? You just I, like that. I was, was an entertainer. No, oh, that's true. Yeah. So, wow. We would also be in charge of the DJ would be in the front and then the two dancers, side, one on each side, teaching them the Macarena, which was huge back in 1994. Yeah. And then the Time Warp Dance, we'd play these songs. And like I would, so I would get like 50 bucks to go to um, a wedding or a bar. So every time we do a gig, I would get $50. So usually Friday nights, we I would do something. Saturday, I'd probably do two, and Sunday, I'd probably do two. So for a weekend in 1994, that was decent money. Yeah, it's super interesting. So let me ask you a question. So people can't see you, they'll see your picture. So yeah. you, you have sleeves. When was your first tattoo? <laughs> so I, I'm thinking you're going to these 18 or 19. Didn't have them. Didn't yet. have them back then. Didn't have them. The 90s weren't as acceptable back then. Yeah. Um, so when did this transition start to happen as well? I'm with, trying, the, with the tattoos. And so I actually got my first tattoo when I moved to L.A. on Venice Beach. It's on my back. It, it's really dumb. But I got that one. <laughs> well, you have to tell us. <laughs> it's, just, it's my Zodiac sign, which is so dumb. <laughs> it's so dumb. And then it even says Leo on it. <laughs> And like a quick story on the Leo part of it. Um, when I was younger, so I, I got it. This is not anything I'm proud of. I did get a DUI back in 1995 and I had to go to jail for what the, the, the drunk take. And I was kind of making fun of the cops that were like, uh, there was one really big <laughs> cop. He was so big. And I was a little bit just mouthy in the back of this cop car. And he said, uh, and I was like, Hey, if I got out of this cop car, which one of you guys are going to get me first? <laughs> I didn't have my money on the driver. And I, and then like, they're like, and then he's like laughing at his partner. His partner was, was big. And then I, and then I, they said, we need to hurry up and get you to the station because they're about to do, you know, if you don't get there in time, you're going to miss the breakfast or whatever. And I was like, well, all I care about is whatever. If I, if it's half as good as whatever this guy's eating, right? Like Aww. just hounding this guy, just because I was so nervous. I have to make jokes about yeah. the situation because otherwise I'll freak out. So we get there, and um, and I, there was this guy in one of the cell. And he's banging on the cell. And it's a it's like a glass cell. You can't really hear him, but you can just see him spitting on it. <laughs> and I'm freaking out. And I was like, hey, man, you guys, you guys have been awesome. Just whatever happens, don't put me in there with that guy. <laughs> and sure as crap, man, I got oh, put no. in there with that guy. And like, he was yelling, you, you pigs, you took my, you took my wallet, you pigs. And I was like, they took my wallet too. I'm trying to, get, <laughs> I'm trying to be on his side. Yeah. yeah, you pigs, you took my wallet. And um, the uh, the tattoo says Leo on the back, and uh, he's like, "Is that your name?" And I was like, "Yeah, that's yeah. my name." <laughs> he's like, "Give Leo back his his wallet." And I had this dude on my side, oh. and he's like getting really aggressive. And they come in, and they're like, they tackle this guy and carry him out. And I'm just so scared. I'm just like, yo, I, I'm glad you guys got him out of here. He was, <laughs> he was giving me a headache. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. You so, blend. Blend in. Yes, I have to. So you get there. You get your, your first tattoo. You're doing dancing. Yeah. So where does where does career go? Career is everywhere at this point. Like, I ended up, um, the girlfriend that, I had a girlfriend move down from here, and she moved in with me. And then she actually paid for me to go to bartending school it was like a, a week maybe two weeks yeah it was two weeks when i turned 21 so i found down there 18 19 20 21 so we're now four years down in la i was doing um the dancing that i worked over at this company called thomas cook foreign currency exchange company that was a full-time gig um and then i got into bartending and then i started bartending i left all those other things away and did I, you get into any TV shows, movies? I did. Thing? I did. Um, I did some um, 
some background work and then I did, I, I was on third rock from the sun a couple times. Um, and then a lot of like B stuff. And then, um, some, some, I had a couple lines in, um, Melrose place back in the day, the Melrose yeah. place. Um, and so was it exciting? Or yeah. Like, like looking back, you're really calm about it. But yeah. at the time, it must have been a thrill. Like yeah, it's fun. Every one of those gigs you got had to have been like, this could be the next Well, what's funny is when uh, the third rock from the sun, when I got pitched for that, the lady, did you ever watch third rock from the sun? Yeah. So it's the tall Sally. She yep. was the one that actually lined, and that lined up all the guys, and she picked me out of all the guys. So I thought that was cool. That is super cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So those were, I, I did those things, and then I did like bartending. The typical L.A. job. Right, you do auditions and then you work bartending. Go bartending. Yeah. What was your style? Were you like in just different roles? Did you have like a specific like? Um, I always yeah, career? I liked so like I did really well, which is this is gonna sound bad, but I did real well when and I loved it. I preferred it when I was like a crazy person, like somebody that is <laughs> not yeah. my norm, right? Like I got to dig yeah. deeper and just be somebody that was crazy and and just psychotic. I we I did like a small like short film um and that was probably my favorite one was just a psychotic stalking boyfriend but was oh, trying wow. to be cool, you know. <laughs> oh, you're going to have to give it some just well, so, so we can put I'm, it in the I'm real, looking, man. Yeah, I am DB. Yeah. Is, uh, your name's going in after we leave. <laughs> <laughs> super cool so uh, we're about a half hour in so I want to yeah. make sure we get to all yep. of your stories so I have a lot of them it's, it's been a crazy life yeah so so take us through I'm one of those guys that like and people always ask me like right now I just started jujitsu like six months ago oh. and everyone's like why are you doing like, you do so much you're here 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 because man one day we're not going to be able to do anything we're going to be, I'm going to, I want to be able to sit in this old person's chair and just know that I'm comfortable sitting in this chair because I got to try everything out in life. I love it. I absolutely love it. Because there's one day, like, I'm sore, right? But one day I'm going to wish I could be sore. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. There's a um, book that I'm reading. It's called Die With Zero. And it talks about, to your point, that, you know, the, the age between, let's say, 20 and 60. Mm-hmm. And really, it's between 20 and 50. Those are the years that you can get all, you can maximize your time. Mm-hmm. When you get to 70, 80, what you're living on is those memories yep. that you had from that time. Yep. So bank them. Yeah. Which is what you're talking 100%. about. 100%. Just throwing them all in there. So I, I don't ever take every any day granted. I'm up to when, like, so many things. Um, you know, I'm starting a clothing line now because that's something I want to do. It's, you know, I want to be creative, you know, and I'm, I'm, uh, I still have my business. And then um, I got this crazy scheme that I'm going to do in 2026. I've got it all, like, in my head and I'm planning it out. 2026 is going to be nuts for me, but... Well, let's take you back to your thirties, yeah. and then we'll get we'll get to your <laughs> yeah. business. So, tell us yeah. about your thirties. Like, yeah. you go through your twenties in L.A. Did you For, come back? No, no, I came back. Um, there's a whole issue with that. I had to go. I was hospitalized, so they had to release me to my parents. So, well, you got to uh, tell us what were you hospitalized? Oh, it was. Um, they still they they said it was either Crohn's disease or stress, which is our like I feel like two different sides of the spectrum. But um, I was I was at a point where anytime I would eat, I'd throw it up. I wasn't taking anything down. Um, I, I had a severe stomach cramps. I was in the hospital for like a month. Oh wow! Yeah, um, and uh, so yeah, they finally released me on those two conditions that I was either Crohn's disease or stress, and I had to be in the care of my parents. So I moved back up here, um, and then. Yes, things got a little bit better, actually a lot better. And then, yeah, and then I had my, my, at 30, I had my first child. So. Okay. So did, did you get married? Did you tell, take us through meeting Man. the mother of the child? <laughs> there's a big smile. Yeah, no, there's not a big smile. <laughs> there's not a big smile. Oh, um, that's just the, like, oh. Um, the, so she was, she was the, um, when I was bartending up here, she would come in with her friends and she was just somebody I had a crush on. And so I have two beautiful girls from this uh, individual and um, yeah, pride of my life. Those two helped me even better become an even better person. So yeah, um, 30 and then 32 was my second one. Um, and then, yeah, just I, I was struggling around that time and I was working at a mortgage company. And then the uh, mortgage company went under and they couldn't pay me my checks, my last, my, my commission checks, my, my salary check. 
And I didn't have no money for diapers. I had no money for food. It was just like, and I vowed I would never, ever work for anybody ever again. That was the last time. So transitioning back here, was that like you were, uh, I know the sickness, but was that like you're putting acting? Like At the time I thought I was going to, yeah. No, I wanted to. You wanted to continue. Yeah, I wanted to continue. I wanted to go back, but then, you know, this happened and have an anchor and it's all right. Um, yeah, so I figured, I found other ways to try to become an entertainer. And that's kind of when I started the comedy also around that time. So you lose but, that job, two kids, mm-hmm. you've been in acting. Have you ever been a comic before? Take us through. No, going I was into never. Comedy. I had always wanted to try comedy. It's always been something that I loved and had a passion for. Um, but I was just too scared to get up there and tell jokes and have nobody laugh. That's the biggest fear in comedy. In comedy, but you have to go through that. That's just something that you have to go through to excel in it. Um, I would. I had a like even when I lived in LA, I had a notebook and I would write my jokes down. And I had like a a good sized notebook of jokes over ten years old that you know that I would write down and never had a chance to try it. So I remember I'll never forget my first. So how I did it was I signed up online and they had this place um, downtown um, and you sign up online. And so I was like, okay, I'm committed to it now. I have to, (laughs) I have to do this. So I told my best friend, I was like, Hey man, don't tell too many people. Don't tell anybody actually, (laughs) but I'm going to go do this thing. If you want to come and check me out, that'd be great. And he's like, yeah, of course I'll always, I'll be, I'll always be there for you. And, um, I went down there and I did my, and I, and it was funny was I was trying to be like this, this cocky known comic, but I was just a nobody. I was trying to play the role and I've told the person that was doing the host that, and I create, okay, let me back up. I created a, a character. His name was leaf. That's who leaf leaf is the comedian. Okay. That's your tattoo. Yeah. Leaf is the comedian and leaf. I would tell, I created this whole character at the time um, because I didn't want some of the things that I said come back to haunt me in my professional career. I was just kind of starting off massage, but I was also doing um, mortgages also. Yeah, so you have a different persona. So tell us who Leaf is. Leaf Leaf was the the stoner (laughs) telling like jokes about being high and things that were funny like i thought were, and the iron irony behind it was i didn't really even smoke that much weed <laughs> i had to pretend that i was high and like i just had and i even changed my voice and i was just like kind of raspy and like it was just a different person and was it based on anybody what year was this is it 2000s Two, so this was i started comedy 2000 and I want to say 10. So wait, Ariana was born on five. Oh, 2007, 2000. Yeah. Okay. 2008. And so obviously leaf was important. You got him tattooed on you. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I was already a known comic when I did this. So this is because if you, uh, we'll get into that too, but I had known I was going to have to do some time some prison time. And so I did this whole series called getting prison ready. And I had, a, I had a tattoo artist. I'd brought a camera crew and they filmed me getting my prison tattoos. So I could, <laughs> be, so I could be ready. You're a real manifester. It sounds like yeah. you see things. Uh, yeah. So we're talking around a lot, but now yeah. I got to know what were you going to prison for? So and when I was in the mortgage company, I owned a mortgage. When I was in the mortgage business, I owned a mortgage company and I was, um, we'll just, it's such a long story. Yeah, high level. High yeah. Level. Um, but short story was I helped some people save their homes that were going into foreclosure. I found a loophole. Um, government frowned upon it. And um, I was caught seven years after I had done it. And then they put me in for two years. Got it. So not necessarily a loophole. Oh. No, it wasn't a new call. It's just frowned upon. When you're falsifying documents to get these people loans to get out of those loans. I watched those documentaries. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Every weekend. And, I, and, you know, I, I, it's crazy because everything that I've ever been through, um, I'm thankful for. Like, I literally have blessed, like, thanked God millions of times for A, even though I had to go away for two years, it could have been way worse. It could have been, they were charging me with like 30 counts, 30 years each. 
and I got away with two years and I didn't, I didn't lose so much time of my life that it would really affect me for the long term. You know what I mean? I did miss out on my, I did miss out two years with my girls, but it also, um, man, when you, when you have everything taken away from you like that and you never want to come back to a situation like that, there's something about like being able to eat when you want, take showers when you want, the freedom of, I I mean, there was one time I didn't have grass for eight months. And when I got out in that field and I, I literally, when I got out and I laid on that grass, because I got transferred to another place where there was outside, I laid out there in the sun and the grass. I had never been so happy. Yeah, so I got to ask you a couple questions on this. So you're going through comedy Mm -hmm. while you're getting ready to go to prison. Yeah. So you go away for two years. So before that, I was I was an up and coming comic. I had told the public what what I was, what I did, why I did it, and what's happening to me. And I did that with the the mindset of you've got to stay in there in the in the spotlight. It would help me also, right? So my buddy. We were allowed to write on emails. It cost money. But if you wrote emails, you had like an account and you put money on the books and you can write emails. So I would write a letter once a week from prison and I would email it to my buddy. He would cut and paste it and put it on my uh, Facebook page, letters from Leaf. And so the public still got to interact and see who I was. And he would cut, very copy all the, yeah, co- all, yeah. <laughs> so very, yeah. he would cut, co- copy all the comments and then email them back to me. So I got to read what people were saying. And then, pe- and then he would always have the address of where I was at. People would send me so much fan mail. It was so oh, wow. awesome. That's crazy. I, I got to know. So you, but when you're going through this, you're, mm-hmm. you're comic, um, you're getting ready to go to prison. Mm-hmm. Would you consider yourself hard at the time? Like tough? No, hard? absolutely not, man. I literally <laughs> Googled what to expect in prison. Like, cause that's a white collar. Oh, that's that's what, what I white. Do. I Googled what the hell do I do now? Oh. Like what, what do white people do in prison? <laughs> so were you scared? Like scared? Yeah. Unbelievable. So you, you go in and where, where did you end up going? Um, First place was called, uh, and it was in Los Angeles, MDCLA. And I remember everybody was like, "Oh, you're going to, you're a, you're a white collar crime. You're going to go on vacation. They've got golf courses. You're going to have salad bars." I'm like, "Really? That sounds amazing." <laughs> Google didn't have that. No. And then when I went there, I'm I'm stuck on the fifth floor. I'm not getting out for. They wanted me to do my entire two years there on the fifth floor in a jail cell. Like I asked, "Hey, excuse me, is there a salad bar?" <laughs> I heard there was a salad bar. Where's the golf? Of Matter of fact, where's the park? Are we going on an outing? Yeah. Like it was not what I, they told me it was going to be like. It, and one thing I remember was people would always say, um, "Oh, your time's going to go by fast. It'll be fine. It's only two years, man. You go do two yeah, years." Yeah, are these people? You go. There? It's, that's and it's then when I got out, they're like, "Man, you're out already." I was like, "Screw you, yeah, dude. That, that's you. long." So. Are you are you realizing all of these things that are happening in the most? So hindsight, mm-hmm. you know, we always look back and learn mm-hmm. and what we appreciate and all that stuff. But as these things are happening, are you very in the moment, like understanding what I, I guess- felt? I had a victim mentality a little bit, especially um, in the beginning of that process. I did have a victim mentality. I had a victim mentality for quite some time, and and I will. I will say this for the rest of my life. I am thankful I went to prison. I am thankful that I went there and had to experience that struggle. Um, I remember day one, I wanted to die. I wanted to literally die. I could not figure out how I was going to get through two years of this. Um, and I was at my lowest point that right there. And I, and I'll, t- and I, and I, talk to people. Um, I do coaching and I do, you know, I mean, a lot of like uplifting things, um, seminars and things like that, where I tell people this story and it's because I have been at my rock bottom. People are always, you're going to find your rock bottom. Um, I, I mean, I was in a prison cell with everything taken away from me, asking my parents to put money on my books just so I can get a thing of peanut butter. You can't get lower than that. Right. I mean, you could, but I don't want to, I don't want to see what lower than that is. And during that time, did you go through a transformation? I did. From the low to the, I did. to walk us through that. Where, where did so you start I, looking at the future? I, so obviously when the days are going by, so you, you know, you got to keep yourself, I kept myself busy, but I, 
a lot of times people would go to prison and they sit and there's, they sleep or they're lifting weights and that's all they're doing. And I'm like, I'm not going to waste these two years. Like I'll never get these two years back. What is it that I can do? They had online schooling. They had a program that I enrolled in, um, for cognitive behavior. And so I, I dove into that and it was probably the best thing that's ever happened to me because I'm able to, I gained so much knowledge from that program. So it's like everything happens, right? Everything's going this way. Like, yeah, this sucks. I had to go to prison, but I got something so much out of it that I will never, I would never want to give that up. The, the amount of progress I made from my entire life to those two years are, are, is, is, it's, it, it's unbelievable how much change I made in two years versus the times I was just lost before that. Yeah. Comedy was cool. Right. But I was, I was still not really like successful. I wasn't doing anything with, I was just telling jokes on, on the weekends and making a little bit of money, but I still had to provide for my family and I was just lost. So when you come out, does, does leaf die there? No leaf no. actually <laughs> leaf became, I remember my comeback show and it was, it was because I was staying in the public's eyes. People wanted to, we had a big old poster. I'll have to show it to you guys one time. We had a big poster, Leafs back, but they, it was all outlined of nobody wanted, I didn't want nobody to see what I looked like. Cause I had made such a transformation physically as well. Mm. Um, I, I think I went in at like 240 pounds and I got out at 185 Mm. Yeah. So not a healthy 240. No, I was bloated from drinking and like always being out on the road or telling jokes. We always, that's what we do. We drink as a comedian, but I, you can see pictures. I'm just so bloated from the alcohol. Um, and I went ahead and, and, and we did this whole show and I had, it was sold out, sold out show, all these people. And it never felt so good to see so many people that were just excited to see me come back. Um, and I had, <laughs> I had this lady, uh, cop who dressed up in lingerie, like a correctional officer. And I dressed like Hannibal Lecter and they wheeled me onto the stage <laughs> in my orange jumpsuit. And I just peeled this orange jumpsuit off and the crowd stood up and just started cheering. Cause I was free. And I, you can see pictures of me doing like this. And oh, I hope so, I get them for the real. <laughs> I want them for the such, real. Send them. Such, um, uh, a, a, one of my f- most favorite moments was watching the crowd jumping to like, I think it was Akon uh, or <laughs> one of the songs and they were just jumping and they were loud and they saw me take that orange jumpsuit off and very symbolic. It was such a, a great moment. And um, were you worried that would take you back into, so coming out just, I mean, old habits or old lifestyle. Were you worried that it No, would- I learned so much from that program that I, I did when I was in there that they, t- they gave me the skills to check my thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's one of the biggest things um, that I learned, like, um, and I continue to learn and I continue to process these things. Uh, like all of our emotions come from thoughts. And so... I it, I don't ever want to feel antsy. I don't ever, if, you know, there's a reason why it becomes, it comes from a thought. So you have to evaluate that thought. Why am I feeling this way? What's the thought behind it? So like those things, all that criminal activity, I don't have, I mean, I turned in my library books on time now. Like it's, I, there's, no, I'm, I'm not jaywalking. I'm pressing the button. I'm not doing nothing. Welcome to my life. Nothing wrong. Rule follower now. Yeah. Like, like I'm good. Like I don't, well, um, they, I was one of the biggest things I took was to remember where you came from. Always remember where you came from. I can smell, I can feel, I can just hear everything that I went through those two years. And if I, if there's ever a choice that I think I might be messing up, like that comes to my mind. One thing that I will never, ever, ever forget. And if I cheer up right now, it's because it means so much to me. <laughs> Take a breath. Yeah. No rush, my man. No rush. My. <clears throat> you good. You good. My kids came to saw me. And my youngest, I'll never forget. This is why I, I have this vision and the sounds in my head. My youngest. 
it was time to leave from visiting. They hadn't seen me in a year and a half. And I'm a, like, it's Father's Day. My parents thought it'd be a good idea to bring them all the way down to Southern California. And it was such a bittersweet. But like, when it was time to leave, I'll never forget my four year or yeah, my four year old crying that she had to leave me again. <laughs> that she had to leave me again. I'll never forget that and because of that, it stays with me and I will never leave her again. It's powerful. Yeah, yeah that sucked. It sucks. It sucks. Like she just, I just remember her saying, bye, pa Papa. My kids call me Papa. Mm. And so I just remember her saying, bye, Papa. And she couldn't breathe because she was crying so much. Thank you. Oh. And like, I'll never forget that. And that's what I have. Every time I have to make a decision to stay focused. It's just, I, I won't do that to my kids again. And I have become a better person and a better father and a better everything just because of that moment. And so take us through. That's incredibly that powerful. Out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a second. I'm going to play you a clip from someone. From Danny, actually, while you're catching your breath here. I think those moments are, you know, when you can turn it into something that obviously has stayed with you and can be the thing that makes or breaks you making a bad decision. It's my why. I think, exactly. And and people sometimes over. So I'm going to play this for you. Uh, This is the impact you have on Danny, and then we'll talk about impact you have on (laughs) Yo, what up, man? Flo here. Hey, man, just a little bit. Um, about Troy, who you're going to be having in tomorrow, I believe, for your podcast. Great and dude, dude. He's a sports massage therapist, and he's freaking absolutely amazing with his hands, man. <laughs> Messiah. <laughs> and just downright good dude, dude. Just his number one thing is helping people. Even though it, it running him into the ground, he's just like, hey, man, I'm put here for a reason, and that's to make people better. And he no doubt does that. He's looked out for me. He's looked out for my son. He's looked out for whoever I've sent his way. Never bats an eye when I say, hey, man, I got somebody who comes in, but, you know, can you kind of not make him go through the whole waiting list game? And he helps me out in that way. Just one love simple if you ever have a chance brother get in there and (laughs) work out those kinks with him you know talking about the changes you've had like Mm -hmm. that's just one person we both know danny yeah i have to edit out his f-bombs but um (laughs) how does that make you feel like not just the change you had from your kids but the change you have the impact you've had on other people and i want to talk about the bigger picture but yeah He's right. Like I've, I've adapted to feeling like that's my purpose. Like I have an amazing gift that I have it. How do I say this? Like I, yeah, I went to school, but like the things that I'm doing on people can't be taught. Like it's, I mean, I I try and teach my therapist some of the techniques that I have, but like when it comes down, it's just crazy. Like some of the things that when I help people, I've had a lady that just started crying because she's been using a cane for 20 years, for 20 years, just in pain. And one session with me, she can walk with no cane. So it's like, it's like, what do you do? Tell us about what you do. I do muscle manipulation. It's not not just the muscle manipulation. So there's two paths I want to go down. You talked about Mm -hmm. being motivational to people. Mm -hmm. That's one. We'll start with the muscle manipulation. And then I want to talk about that. So what, what is the official title? Like, or, or is it massage therapy? It is under the massage therapy. Um, umbrella. I don't like to use massage therapy just because the word massage, I don't really massage people. I find where they're having a, like a, a, a problem, a buildup, um, something that's a restriction. I find where they have a restriction and I find the muscle that's doing it. And I have a reason and I find how, and I, and I just, I break it open and, and it expands and then they're pain free. And so how do you get there from the story we've gone to, mm-hmm. to, to leaf, to prison, right. family, to getting out, to the orange jump shoot yeah. coming off? To- so I was, I still, I still was a comedian. 
And um, there was a point where I was at another crossroad. I've had lots of crossroads. Um, and no disrespect to my kid's mom. she's She does the best that she can, but she just couldn't be a parent. And so around my kids were seven and nine, I believe. I got a phone call like, come get your effing kids because we were splitting week on week off. She said, come get them. I came to her house and my kids were in the front yard with all their stuff in garbage bags. Like that's the person I was dealing with. And I took my kids in. And at that point I knew like being, my parents were such big help, but they were getting older as well. Um, I couldn't go on the road for two, three weeks doing comedy. I, I would always plan my shows around when my kids were with their mom or something like that. And so I, and you know, sometimes my parents would watch my kids if I had to, a local show late night or I was going to an open mic to practice new jokes. But the point, um, the, it became a problem because I was making decent. I was doing okay. Right. But like I started, I was already doing massages at a chiropractic office and I was getting busier than the chiropractor. And I'm like, man, what if I just put a hundred percent effort into this comedy will always be here. Let's just hang up the microphone for a little bit and put a hundred percent effort into this healing thing that I've got going on because I learned, right. I learned massage during massage school, but they don't teach you what I've, what I'm got going on right now. Like I literally figured these things out on my own, like all the techniques and the, and the things that I do, I winged it and it worked and then I worked, did it again and it worked. And then I tried, you know what I mean? I've seen so many people trial and error. And so some of the things that I do right now, it's just like I've done it so many times and I, I know what to go to. So I want to pull some of it out of you. Um, give us like two cases. Like you said, someone had a cane, right? Yeah. Tell us some of the biggest impacts you've had. Yeah. The lady, I'll never forget her. Like she, after I worked on her for probably about 45 minutes to an hour, maybe a little bit more. Um, I asked her, let's have you walk around a little bit. And so she started to walk and then you could just see her standing up straighter. Mm -hmm. And she said, here, hold this for me. I need to see something. And she started to walk around the office and she, the, she was just crying. She goes, you don't understand. I've been to everybody. I've seen so many people. They want to do surgery. They want to do surgery. And I was able to help her. And like, I'm not just saying like, then she went back to the cane. Like she does not use her cane anymore. And what did you do? And how did you like, how did you find it when you were doing it? Uh, there's like, a muscle that a lot of chiropractors and, and doctors, they don't ever look at it. It was her, it was her, it's called the psoas muscle. It was her psoas that was locked up. It was pulling on her spine. She was pulling her forward. And I just released that. Like I, I manually released that, let it go. I made it longer. And it, and it made her stand up straight with no lower back pain. She goes, when I, when you're in pain for 20 years and you finally feel no pain, it's such a shock to your system. She said mm. she had no pain. It's crazy. Give us another one. Yeah, Tell us another wow. story. I had the live video too. You can actually see this guy. He could not put his arm, like if he wanted to talk on the phone, he could not talk on the phone. Right? Oh, wow. That was it. That's all he had with his motion was to his head for those people that can't see, you know, and they couldn't, he was drink, bringing his phone up to his, he couldn't put it up to his head. It was locked. And I actually show me working on him. I, I had the video of me doing it before, like testing it out. And then, um, and then him, and you could see his face. So not everybody can see what we're looking at, but he has, he has full, yeah, he's, full range. Yeah, yeah. And he starts crying Aww. and he drove all the way from like Manzanita or not Manzanita. Uh, what's down South man, man, Manteca? Manteca. Thank you. I said Manzanita. Yeah, he drove all the way from Antica. And so this is just from time, just teaching yourself and learning. Mm -hmm. or does this go back to your time in prison and what the things no. you were taught? Wait, how, did you get, how did you so get it? So I into? went, I was massage, I massage school, right? And it was an extensive massage school. It was like two years worth. It was, they taught you kinesiology, physiology, sociology, like everything they taught you. It was like a, uh, we took two, um, not biology, human anatomy classes, two different ones. So all these college courses and then it was 800 and something hours of massage practice. So it was very extensive. It was a two year program. And then from there I went on and I started off at like massage envy and I couldn't stand it. Um, could not stand 
like when you're stuck in a room and it's <laughs> dark and there's candles and they, I, I'll never forget. They had this <laughs> two hour whale song, this two hour <laughs> whale song. And then the reason why I remember this is because I was about to work on this person. They, this guy booked a two hour appointment with me and I was really just, uh, I, I was uh, upset with that, that I have to work on this guy and like massage envy. It's like, it's fluffy, right? So I have to like pet this man for two (laughs) hours in the dark. I'm like, dude, do you know what you just booked? And he requested me, which was like, (laughs) come on. So, so we always would wait outside the door and I have to knock, like I used to say, go get undressed where you're comfortable and I'll be in a minute. Right. And I, and I remember, I'll never forget right before I knocked on the door, the two hour whale song started and I was like, Oh my God, I got to do two hours with this gentleman and the whales just going, <laughs> like if you, I've, I, that was two low points. I I wanted to kill myself in prison. I wanted to kill myself in massage in me. <laughs> and oh, I never forget. I almost quit. I almost walked out of there. I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I went for massage in me. Um, and then I worked at a chiropractic office for about ten years. And um, that's when um, yeah, yeah. So you're changing people through your work. So. We're at an hour, but I want to talk real quick about yeah. your motivation and just the way you like to inspire people. What does that look like for coaching? Right? Yeah, so I coach a lot of like, A, I coach massage therapists around the country that are just starting their business, that want new ideas or need uh, technique help. Because I am able to translate some of the things that I do onto the therapist. I do own a company here in Roseville called Get Me Goings. Um, it's in Roseville and we've been, we started that in 2018 and it's been pretty successful so far. And I've had therapists, uh, and it's just part of the business where they come in, they learn my techniques. Cause I, I make sure that anybody that comes in, I tell them, forget everything you learned in massage school. I'm going to teach you my techniques and every single one of them, there hasn't been one that doesn't get a lot of bookings after they come working here. They, I mean, we're talking week two, three weeks out, four weeks out, each one of them to the point where of course they're going to want to go do it on their own. So I am, I'm proud to say I am responsible for seven different businesses here in the Roseville area that all have my technique that are killing it. Oh, congrats. Yeah. Yeah, That's really cool. Yeah. So there's seven different. So what makes me happy about that is I can't touch everybody, but if they can get a little bit from somebody else, then my, my healing process has been able to expand. And that's kind of what I'm, I'm leaning to more towards the teaching part. And that's why I said in 2026, I've got this crazy idea to just go for it. Like, um, I'm, I'm going to start a YouTube channel, right? And it's called goings out, goings out, meaning I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I'm going to um, condense everything that I have and I'm going to go from what city do I want to go to? Do I want to go live in um, Utah for a little bit? I'll stay in Utah and I'll hit up any massage therapist that wants training. And that's, I'm just going to train and train and train. Like they can, I can do three or four days of training at their spot, at their location, do another one for the next week, another one for the next week. And then when I'm done, I can go, let's go to Miami and I'm just going to live like that. Like I'm, I'm trying, trying this whole, and then I'll film it the whole time. Like the road trip, the, the, you know, the, the sessions, the, 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 the different therapists that were, we're meeting and training and then you know if they if we get a good enough following maybe the restaurants that i eat at will want me to do a review see so i just got this huge crazy yeah. plan to for you know. someone who doesn't have plans that's a whole now, this like, one i've never <laughs> had right i even had the exact day june 20th 2000 26 two years from now yeah you know, i have the exact day which is yep. really cool june 20 2026 And I'm going to start filming like me condensing my house right now. I'm going to leave the house. I'm not going to sell it like I thought at first, but like I'll let my kids live there. They just got to pay rent and then the mortgage is paid. Right. And then I'm going to sell my car, which is going to be really hard. My Camaro, I'm going to sell that. (laughs) I am taking the Harley. I'm not, it's going to be towed because there's going to be beautiful roads to ride around in. But yeah, I'm just going to live minimally. I and love then, it. And I then love just it. train therapists all over the nation so that they can, I can, I feel like I'll be able to help more people that way. 
And it sounds like that's your passion now is, is helping people get better. Like it has to be an addiction once you start to see that you can help people. Well, and remember, my thing was entertaining too, right? I, I wanted to be an actor. So I think I found how to put them together by doing the the YouTube channel and the show and the filming of me traveling. I get to entertain the crowd while I'm just driving, you know what I mean? And then show up at somewhere and I can show my techniques to as I'm training other therapists. So now I feel like I've just finally com- combined the two. And like, I was just thinking like, man, how amazing would it be to wake up in some somewhere in Texas or Utah or anywhere, you know what I mean? Montana and just, what do you want to do today? And just do whatever you want to do and then train people Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you explored the area and just live life. And then like, uh, yeah. And then continue doing my coaching online on my clothing line online. That's why I'm starting to do all this stuff now so that everything is online and I don't have to be tied down to anything. The business will still be running here. I've got good therapists. I'm I'm actually going to start like, I want to frame, I want to get another one open in Folsom and then I'm going to franchise them to the, to the employees so that they can, I just take a commission off of it and then they keep the rest and let them handle all that. So it's been an incredible story, and I know we only scratched the surface. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Would you say, would you define yourself as successful? Have you hit success, I should say, for you or your definition? I have, and and I've recently just hit success because I'm actually, if you see my shirt, I I'm spending more time with my kids. I'm tr- I'm coaching her so- her senior year at her school. I get to coach her softball team. Um, I'm I'm not working like I used to. I used to work twelve hours, six seven days a week, and I'm actually just being able to use the word no. And I feel like that's my success. Like Danny said. He's always been so willing to help others. I'm really trying to <laughs> counteract that and say, hey, I can't. Like, that's, I have to, like, now my new success is saying no. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. I've, I've always given up so much time for my kids. I blinked and they're senior and junior. Mm. And now, you know what I mean? I work so hard to provide because I'm the only one that financially, I'm the only one that does anything for them. Uh, I think I just put it together. So June 20th, 2026 is when your youngest graduates. <laughs> she doesn't graduate. She graduates the year before. Year before. Mm-hmm. But year. I want to give them a year to just get established, see what they want to do. Not pull the rug from them. They have a place to stay, but I want them to be yeah. able to pay for the rent. You know what I mean? And so I want, and then it's just my dad's birthday, June 20th. So uh-huh. I want to just do that. All right, because, last question for yeah. me. When's Leaf coming back? <laughs> it's so it's so funny that you said that because I have always I have that itch. I have the itch to go back and I get asked quite a bit like, "Hey, when are you going to go on stage?" And I almost did a show. I get there's this guy, his name's Lance Woods. Shout out Lance Woods. He's always invited me to his, he has a monthly show at Punchline. He's mm-hmm. always invited me to be on that. And so I just need to let him know what month I want to do it in. I'm there. <laughs> let us know. We're and, there. Yeah. I just don't. <laughs> oh my gosh, that'd be so fun. Yeah. I just want to. There was a time when people were like, hey, you could still do comedy, just do local shows. And I'm like, nah, man, like I respect comedy so much. I don't want to just tell the same jokes for six years, seven years at small little at the same shows. You know what I mean? I, there's a comic, a few of them that do that. They get so comfortable with their funny jokes. There's one guy that he tells the same jokes when I first started. That he does now, and I just recently saw him, and I can memorize. I memorize his. I <laughs> I know all his punchlines, right? I don't want to be like that. I respect it. So you have to like take the time to write the jokes, go to open mics and try them out, right? And then perform them, f- fix them. Tr- you know what I mean? And so like I've got I've I got some good ones written, and and um, being a single dad raising two girls when you never had girls in your family <laughs> oh, is gosh. comedy in gold? itself. Oh, is that your gold? Oh, <laughs> thank you, comedy gods. Um, so with your messaging, I think that's a um, between your work, your life, mm-hmm. like, you know, sharing your story and all that. What are some of the biggest, I guess, messages that you share with people? Any, like, themes yeah. in what you talk about? What are some of those messages? There's a couple of them. Share? One of the, my biggest things is uh, me being 48 years old and not being afraid to try new things. I think that that's huge, especially when 
I think about this every day. Like I'm running out of time, even though I'm only 48, I'm young. Right. But I still feel like I'm running out of time and I, I almost give myself a little bit of anxiety because I'm trying to do so much. Mm-hmm. But, um, I think the, one of the biggest things that I like to tell people, like try a new business. What's the worst that can happen? You're going to fail, but you're in no different spot than if you didn't try, you know what I mean? Um, it's better to have, get rid of your what ifs. I always talk about what ifs, like what if I have done this? What if I had done that? If you get rid of them, you don't have to worry about where you're at in life. And I just, you know, go for it. Just try whatever, like be uncomfortable, put yourself in uncomfortable situations And that's part of what life is. Like, we're all here to learn stuff. You know what I mean? Like, grow. If we just do the same thing, go to get up, go to school, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, go to work. Like, that ain't living life, man. That's Mm -hmm. that's just being um, that's like life's living you. You're not doing anything special for yourself. And one day your time's going to come and you're going to sit there and wonder, did you do everything? You're going to have those what ifs. And so it's really important to like, if you want to try a new hobby, try it. There's never too late. You know, Colonel Sanders. Yeah. I just read on this. Oh, yeah. How old was he? When he, when he became so, yeah. Colonel Sanders. Crazy. Right. So there's yeah. never, a, there's no limitations. The only limitations is in your head and what you are telling yourself. So if you fail, that's cool. Try it again or try something else, but don't ever give up and don't ever be comfortable. That's my biggest message is don't ever give up and don't ever be comfortable because once you become comfortable, your life is just boring. Yeah, that's true. I love it. Well, my second question is a little bit into that, but it's my staple one that I ask all all of our guests, most of them, depending on their age, but. Oh my God. um, So. (laughs) Um, this better not be an old man question. No, it's not. It's not. It's okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. You tell me. Um, so looking back, so think of yourself at who you were at 30, Yeah. what your life was like, uh, knowing who you are now, being who you are now, everything you've learned, where you're at. Like yeah. if you could have a conversation with I'd your 30 I'd punch that guy in the face. <laughs> punch okay, him what if hard you, what in the throat. What if you had throat. to give him advice? Like one key thing, what would you tell him? I would tell him, first of all, don't do that transaction with that old lady <laughs> that puts you in prison. Don't do that, you schmuck. <laughs> Stop taking the shortcuts. Like that's what I did a lot back then was yeah. take shortcuts. I wanted that. I thought I wanted that money. I thought I wanted that um, – you know what I mean? Like I still felt like it's funny that I, I still say I was helping her save her home, but there was a greedy side to that as well. Like I tried to balance it by saying I was helping somebody save their home, but I was also trying to be the big shot too. Mm -hmm. So there was an ego involved. So calm the ego. That would be my biggest thing to him is calm the ego, become humble. That's good. Excellent advice. Yeah. Troy, this has been awesome. Yeah, yeah I had a good fantastic. time. Yeah, thank you for coming in and yeah, sitting I down loved with it. us. Thank you. Yeah, and being so vulnerable, uh, sharing your story. and um, That's the only way I know how to be now is just yeah. authentic. This yeah. is who I am. And if you don't like it, it's okay. I'm not for everybody, but this is who I am. And I don't ever have to worry about being someone else like I used to be. I'm me now. And it's so much more refreshing and so less stressful. It's just this is who I am. So we want for our listeners is, yeah. you know, getting to know different paths and uh, taking everyone takes a little something out of it. So, yeah. So cool. I, and just in closing, do the work like there's no shortcuts. If you are starting a new business, it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be hard. It's going to do the work. Um, the, the I call it planting the seeds so that you can go out and farm later. Because um, if you don't plant those seeds, you're going to constantly be stressed out and you're not going to have no fruit in the future. So just do the work. Keep your head. There's no shortcuts. <laughs>